My presentation today is going to be it's called Digital Broadcasting Understood. Uh, might be a little bit more misleading because um, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the methods that are approved here in the United States and the installation of the first all digital broadcast facility uh, in the United States as well, uh, which I happen to be here currently in Frederick, Maryland. But let's uh, let's get right to it. Uh, the first pioneer broadcast station, well, let's face it, everybody knows that, that's KDKA. KDKA first began broadcasting in November of 1920. The, the first night was the night of the presidential election in 1920, and they were broadcasting the uh, the results in, uh, in real time as they came in over the... Uh, over the telegraph. My current company, which is Xperia, originally we were named a company called USA Digital Radio. And USADR was then born into Ubiquity Digital, which most broadcasters know, know us as. Ubiquity Digital was really born from Westinghouse Wireless in the early 90s. Uh, much like KDKA was owned and operated by Westinghouse uh, at the factory. Most of the people who came and, and developed the current system that's approved for the United States actually came from Westinghouse Wireless and Westinghouse Defense. The earliest form of uh, digital communication was simply Morse code. And the amount of information that got conveyed uh, was pretty entirely up to the skill of the operator. You know, if they were a faster sender and receiver, then you know, more information got conveyed. So in terms of that, in very simple terms, that's called baud rate. So if you're doing, uh, say, 20 words per minute, uh, you're running a baud of 20 bits. And that's ultimately where we start thinking about in digital terms, bits and bytes, blocks of data. I also found out today, listening, actually listening to the radio, today is my 51st birthday, uh, October 6th. I didn't know this until this morning. Uh, George Westinghouse and I share the same birthday. So, very funny coincidences. So, radio's evolution goes all the way back to the 19th century, you know, starting with, with, with Marconi and his first patents. Then, you know, that entailing, you know, through the amateur ranks and, and, and Reginald Fessenden with the first audio broadcast to 1920 to the, I would say, the 60s, you know, was the golden age of, of AM and the golden age of radio. You know, until TV really started taking over in, in, into the mid 50s, but you know, radio still survived as not necessarily a home medium, but a mobile medium where the listeners could. Radios were getting smaller, transistors were coming onto the scene, and listening habits changed from, like I said, a home environment to a more mobile environment. Cars, portable radios, and such. Uh, 70s FM radio starts to take over and then takes over in popularity and AM starts to wane. The peak for that was in 1982 when finally FM stations outnumbered AM stations for the first time. Today, we have a hybrid digital radio uh, that's approved for use in the United States. Uh, this is a screenshot from an actual aftermarket uh, JVC Kenwood radio receiving an FM signal but we do have radios that show AM signals, and I'll get, I'll get to that later in the presentation. As you can see, we can do much more things with digital. We can convey a lot more of information. You know, we can even convey images and extra channels, extra programming channels, song and artist information. So 100 years later, here we are with digital systems. Digital systems are very complex. There are many of them out there. HD radio is just one of many. Um, there are others that are called digital radio mundial, direct competitor, if you will. There's also Digital Audio Broadcast Plus, which is approved in Europe, uses its own separate frequencies. Uh, there's a system called China Digital Radio. The Japanese have their own as well. All in all, digital systems are very complex and, and, and require a lot of math. The concepts are, 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 are fairly straightforward. For the AM system... We use a system called quadrature amplitude modulation, and I've heard a lot of people make arguments that, you know, we shouldn't be calling the AM band if, if people are wanting to go digital and we're starting to turn on digital signals in the AM band. We really shouldn't call it AM. We should be calling it medium wave because the digital signals are not AM. That's not true. The 
quadrature tube modulation is employed in our system for creating the digital waveform. And what a quadrature AM amplitude, uh, amplitude modulation signal is, is, is you have uh, one carrier or sets of carriers that are uh, occupy the same space. There will be two carriers that occupy the same space. And there will be many sets of those carriers. What happens is, is how do you cram those two carriers on, onto the same exact frequency? Even though there's there's many of them, but you know there's still going to be two sets of carriers conveying two different uh, messages. Uh, one too many, two different ones or zeros. That is because one carrier is is, is called an I or in phase component, uh, which is fed at, at zero degrees phase, uh, and then there is a Q component or a quadrature component uh, carrier that is fed 90 degrees out of phase. So you feed them 90 degrees out of phase so that they won't. Uh, cancel each other out or re uh, interference on each other, but like a, if you were feeding them 180 degrees out of phase, they would cancel each other out uh, at some point, and you would lose information. So they're fed at, at 90 degrees apart. HD radio uses a, a combination of 64 quam and 16 quam for all digital waveform. And the reason why we, I say we use two different combinations is because the 64 quam is, is conveying the audio information and has 64 different sets of carriers that they can convey this info. And the 16 QAM has 16 sets of carriers, but they're using, 64 QAM is using what's called a quadrature phase shift keying. So it's phase shift keying four different bits of information, whereas the 16 QAM we're using is more robustly is binary phase shift keying. So it's either just a one or a zero. There are only two states in the 16 QAM, but there's 16 sets of carriers that convey that information. And it needs to be more robust because those carriers are carrying the information that tells the receiver what to expect. The title and artist information, we're conveying all sorts of uh, info for the receiver. Uh, FCC ID, GPS coordinates of the transmitter, the stereo mode, if there is one, if it's in mono or, or parametric stereo or stereo, it's conveying all sorts of information to the receiver so that when the receiver locks onto the signal, it knows what it's getting. And then the 64 QAM later is decoded to convey the audio information. So if you really want to do a deep dive with this stuff, uh, I invite you to go to www.nrscstandards.org. That has all of our documentation and uh, what's called air interface, A-I-R-R. Anything and everything you want to know about HD radio is at nrscstandards.org. Even uh, other digital systems are, are, are conveyed there as well for other standards. So you can get loads and loads of information. And the, the NRSC is done in conjunction with NAB and, and, and other organizations. Ultimately, at the end of the day, there's, a, like I said, a lot of math. We have to follow in a digital system the OSI model. And the OSI model is the open systems integration model. Everything is defined in layers. There's seven layers total for the OSI model. But we're only using five. Layer five starting with the gathering of information, i.e. we're collecting the information. The audio is coming into the audio card. Data is coming in you know, for, for text or title and artist information. And then it's all done through there. And then ultimately it goes through all the layers. The layer two is where you do most of the magic happens here, where all the scrambling is done, channel encoding, then interleaving. Um, so when, we, when I say we have blocks of information and those 64 carriers carry stuff, we have blocks of eight that each convey 32 bytes. And you'll have what's called convolutional coding. We use a 4-3 convolutional coding, which means, in a sense, we have four streams of these blocks, one through eight, that go, you know, zero, one, two, three, and the convolutional coding that's scrambling will scramble those bits so that you have four of these blocks, but the bit information will be different. And what you do is you interleave those or you, you mesh them together so that the blocks are together. So that what happens now is in a receiver, you have three different streams. It, it tosses one of those four and uses three and it locks on three. What happens is 
if you lose two of those bits, but you still get one, it'll still convey the information with the, with like I said, with the read Solomon forward error correction. And that, that was obviously developed long ago. I don't want to get into it, 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 it because you, you could do a whole presentation just on read Solomon alone. So it forward error corrects. Those carriers are interleaved. So you're getting different information at the receiver. If you happen to lose one of those interleaved block, stream uh, blocks, the other two will pick up the slack. The, 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 the forward error correction will pick up the slack and still convey the information out to the receiver. So that's what makes digital systems much more robust is, is dependent upon the interleaving and, and, and the forward error correction. So the Bach diagram I show here really kind of tells you how to do it. If you really want to do the math, go to NRCS standards. Um, so digital radio capabilities, like I discussed this, uh, you know, clear audio programs free from noise and co-channel interference. Uh, multiple audio channels, program service data, and data services on the display or in the background, i.e. you can see a station logo right there uh, being displayed, and that's, that's actually being transmitted over the HD radio signal. Other information can be conveyed like navigational systems. So there are stations that are transmitting NavTech data. So if you have a car that has na uh, NavTech navigation in it, it may have an HD radio receiver running in the background and conveying the information onto a map. You know, there, there's lots of different data services, things we can do with, with, the, with a digital signal. I would say there's two different modes of our system employed. To the left is what we call MA1, which is just backwards for AM. It's an MA1 waveform, and it combines the digital signal along with the analog signal. So it's a hybrid signal. It's not dependent on the analog, but the analog rides along with it. And if you have an HD radio enabled receiver, the HD radio enabled receiver would recognize that there's a digital signal there. As you can see close to the analog signal, there, there are reference carriers. Those reference carriers, once again, are those 16 clamp carriers that are telling the receiver, hey, I've got a digital signal here, lock onto me, and by the way, here's all the station information. The radio then locks on, and depending upon the signal level, the radio makes the decision whether to let the digital signal go or, or stay with it. That's what we call blending. So it would blend back to the analog. So you wouldn't, if you lost the digital signal, it would just blend back to the analog as a fallback. To the right, we have the MA3 waveform, which is the all-digital waveform. Uh, looks very different uh, because it's not conveying any analog. There is no analog fallback. Uh, you have two sets of primary carriers, one above and one below the center frequency, and those are there to help with uh, multipath or any sort of fading issues or issues driving under what we call a grounded conductive structure or a fancy word for a bridge. You also have secondary and tertiary carriers that reside 15 dB below the, the, the primary carriers. There is no analog fallback here. Uh, if the receiver decides to let it go, it, it lets it go. And uh, there is no uh, fallback. But the MA3 is much more robust than a receiver. I can tell you that. And I, I'll show you uh, later in the presentation. This gets us to the first AM all digital station here in the United States. And that station is WWFD, right here in Frederick, Maryland. I'm right here at the facility as we speak. Uh, to give you some history on the facility, uh, it was originally licensed in 1370 in, in 1959 as WMHI. It was a 500 watt daytime only directional and the towers were completely rearranged. They were halfway spaced and oriented in a different direction. As you can see in the very far bottom right, you can actually see one of the old dog houses that was actually abandoned uh, when they changed the configuration to, uh, to 820. And the facility was moved to 820 in 1991. They moved the tower around uh, and they added sections onto it to increase the height because as you go down in frequency, the towers have to be taller to be quarter wave. Even then, it wasn't enough, and they had to put some uh, top loading on it. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, this facility was proposed by the current program director and engineer for Hubbard Broadcasting at the Consumer Electronics Show in January of 2017. Uh, literally, he wandered into our booth, and I had, had conversed with him on the phone before, but this was the first time I had actually ever met him. And sat down and said, hey, how would you like to make a station all digital? 
we've got a station that's doing absolutely nothing and we would love to experiment with it. The station currently runs 4,300 watts daytime, non-directional in tower two, which is the tower to the, to the right uh, in this picture. Uh, it runs 460 watts nighttime into both towers. Tower one, which is the left-hand tower is the reference. That means when we talk about some of you are not familiar with directional arrays. This this is the reference. This is the, the 1.0. This is where all the other towers in, in an array, say you had a four-tower array, you reference to that one tower. So, you know, tower two may be fed, you know, 0. 0.63 or 63% of the power, when tower three may get 90% of the power. This, is, this gets 100% of the power, and it's the reference. Some things had to be considered. Uh, this station had been neglected for a long time. It was on the air and it was maintained. They, they mowed the grass, they kept the building up. But as far as devoting any technical resources to it, it was just keep the plate spinning. It was, it was just keep it on the air and let's, we don't really want to spend a whole lot of money on it because we don't make a whole lot of money on it. So some things you know, had fallen through the cracks over the years. So we needed to, to do a, an overview of what we really needed we needed to evaluate and modify the antenna if needed. Uh, we already knew going in that we were going to need it. We'll, I'll show you in a minute. Transmitter installation. Could we use the current transmitters that they had, or did we have to bring in new transmitters to do this? Uh, we needed to get an experimental authority. There, there was no authority for anything all digital. The FCC had, has no plans or groundwork or any inkling that somebody was going to do this. So we were going to actually have to get an experimental authority from from the commission to do this. Uh, then there was sign on and testing, and we'll get into that later too as well. Uh, we did a lot of testing. We found a lot of things that raised a lot of eyebrows, and but will help a lot of stations moving forward. So a station transmitting a hybrid, an MA1 HD, really doesn't need to do any modification to its antenna system for MA3. The MA1 system occupies plus or minus 15 a kilohertz frequency, whereas an MA3 occupies plus and minus 10 kilohertz. It actually falls within the channel spacing allowed by the commission for emissions. So MA3 actually works better. It's actually narrower. It's not as wide as MA1. Uh, rule of thumb is standing, the standing wave ratio or SWR of 1.4 to 1 plus or minus 15 kilohertz is adequate for both MA1 and MA3 operations. Uh, we'd like to see it closer to 1.2 for MA3 at plus and minus 10, but 1.4 will work just fine for what we need to do. So this is the antenna system before. This is done with a, uh, a network analyzer and an oscillator fed with a couple watts into, into the antenna system at the common point of the phaser. And this is we're measuring, we're measuring day and we're measuring night, uh, night patterns. Uh, day is only one tower. Uh, night pattern is the two towers uh, being series fed. So as you can see, it's not great. The day we had a 1.8 to 1, but if you moved it out further, it really climbed very fast. The symmetry is there. It, it, it looks almost as identical on the upper as it does lower, which is good. But the, the SWR uh, plus and minus just wasn't going to do it. Um, and what happens when you start having higher SWRs at those edges is it starts cutting off the frequency responses of, of the magnitude and, and uh, uh, component of the digital signal. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. But you need to keep the antenna SWR low and flat through a very broad range of frequencies in order for the system to properly work so that not too much of the digital component is attenuated and therefore not properly decoded in a receiver. Uh, night antenna, as you can see on the right, absolutely awful. The, the, the two tower array, they're quarter wave spaced, quarter wave in height, two to one at minus 10. At minus 15, it's four to one. At minus, uh, minus 20, you know, we're talking over, uh, over seven to one SWR. This essentially in the night tower or the night pattern, was a notch filter. This just was not going to work at all. So the towers are 73 and a half degrees, a quarter wave tall with 26 and a half degrees, making up 
with top loading from the tower guy wires. So the guy wires are bonded to the tower and actually slope down, uh, creating a, a capacity top hat to make up that difference. There are pass and reject filters for a neighboring AM that's literally a quarter mile down the road uh, at 9.30, or we were allowed to turn this station on. We had an experimental station here that was uh, diplexed into the day tower or the night tower, excuse me, that that floats. It's it's not grounded, but we used it during the day, but we couldn't use it at night. But we had a test station here. So there are pass and reject filters uh, before those two stations. Before Hubbard owned this station, uh, when it was an independent, uh, there was a remote pickup unit for when, you know, they did remote broadcast. So there was a remote antenna here. And when you put a, a separate uh, STL or remote antennas or any other and mount any other antenna uh, on an AM tower, you have to isolate it using a device called an isocoupler. So here's a daytime block diagram. The transmitter wants to see 50J0, 50 ohms, no reactants. The long run from the transmitter to the uh, switching phaser cabinet out to the tower is well over 200 feet. So we get build up, believe it or not, not capacitive reactants, but inductive reactants from the length of the line. So we use a, a 0.015 microfarad capacitor to tune out the, uh, the inductive reactants or the X of L to the ATU. Uh, we changed that. And once again, that was one of the problems we ran into. But this was the early setup. It was quick and easy and only cost us a capacitor to do it. We didn't have to build a tuning network for it. We found out later that we did, and get into that later. But the, then it goes to the ATU network or an antenna tuning network, just like an antenna tuner uh, in a ham shack. You're just matching reactances to the tower, to the transmitter, so that the transmitter is happy at, at 50J0. And then the pass reject filters. This is a nighttime block. So you have the transmitter, then it goes into a phasing cabinet, which is what you call common point. That common point wants to be 50J0. It needs to be because the uh, transmitter wants to see 50 ohms. Uh, so it's matching different impedances based on the coax length. Uh, you want to keep the coax length the same going out, even though the, the, the spacing between the building is different. You just coil them up and bury them underground. You want to keep those coax lengths the same. Same with sampling lines. Uh, if you don't have them the same length, you can still tune it out with, with the tuning network and the, and, the, and the common point matching network. But it's, it's easier to make them the same. Here, they are different. They, they are different in length. As you can see, one plus 157 degrees, one minus 38.2 degrees. So we had to measure all the values in the phaser and the antenna tuning unit of all the components. We had to measure the self and drive point impedances of both towers. And so self-impedance means you just disconnect the antenna, you connect a, a impedance bridge, and you figure out where the antenna impedance and resistance is at the operating frequency. Drive point impedance is a little bit different. Drive point impedances are done with a little bit of RF drive because you're actually having the two towers trying to interact. And that is what you get when you get the drive. That's what happens when the towers are interacting. You get a drive point impedance. That's what we mean by drive point impedance. Verify the schematic. Make sure everything was wired the way it was supposed to be wired. Verify and calibrate the antenna monitor and base current meters. All this work was done by Contronics. Basically, they had they took all the components that we had and designed a phaser around it and told us what we were missing. And we had to then procure those parts that were missing to add them to the tuning network. So here we go, approaching the new model for the antenna rehabilitation. This is the old pass reject filter. So what's going to happen is, is in a pass reject filter, you have a series LC circuit for the station, the, 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 the desired, which is 820 kilohertz here. And then you have another series LC network tuned, parallel tuned. So it's in par this, this series LC network is in parallel with the other LC network. And that's going to be the undesired or the reject, which is 930. So you want to tune for a high impedance at 930, but zero impedance for 820 so using those two networks. Tower 2, we found we were already inserting extra 16 ohms of inductive reactants. Tower 1, past reject, which is pictured here, uh, the low-power tower, 
uh, was mistuned by inserting six ohms of inductance reactance as well. So now we're compounding our problem. Not only we're messing with the drive point impedance, but we're messing with the self impedance as well because we're introducing all this reactance that doesn't need to be there. So we had to convert everything. Everything was an L network in the old system. Everything was inductive input. We had to switch everything to T networks because we're not only matching since, but we're, uh, we're changing phase as well. So that's only accomplished in a T network. You can't do that with an L network. An L network will shift phase, but it'll shift phase 90 degrees and 90 degrees only. In a T network, you can shift phase to any value you calculate for varying components. So the reason the reason we use a T network is, is more flexibility for the design of the bandwidth. And we'll show the result bandwidth once we get done. But as you can see there, I'm pictured at the left, you know, drilling and tapping for the new new components. We had to put a new uh, coil and a new vacuum variable capacitor to create this T along with the input branch. This is on the input branch. Then you have the, uh, you show me pictured there on the very right. That's the shunt branch or the grounded branch. And then uh, behind me is the output branch of, of the T-network. And that little computer on the right-hand side is, we're using a device to measure the impedance of the ATU. And we're trying to get it tuned to 50J0 in power. Remember what I said uh, about the isocoupler and the RPU line. To the very left is the RPU coax lines coming in and the STL lines coming in. To the center is the problem. You can see on the big coax, that is the antenna itself coming in. The middle coax is this STL line and it is bonded, the ground strap is bonded to the input to the tower itself. However, the top coax, as you can see, does not have a grounding to that. What happens is, is when you do that, you don't ice the couple, it now interacts with that tower, becoming part of that tower. The math that you do to figure out the drive point impedance and the actual drive point impedance vary. They, they completely differ because you've changed the characteristic of that tower. The math was all designed on the tower and the tower itself, not with an antenna, a, a whip antenna and a piece of coax running 150 feet down the side of it. So you have to bond it so that it's at the same potential. Uh, once we got that fixed, we sat out here, the, the engineer for Hubbard and I, for days trying to figure out what the heck was going on. We could not get the drive point impedance to where it needed to be, which was around 22 ohms and about 80 ohms of capacitive reactance. We could never get it above 17. We couldn't figure out what in the heck was going on. And we were tuning away, tuning away, tuning away. And he looked over and noticed this and he goes, I can't believe after all this time, we didn't see this problem. This was a 10, literally a 10 minute fix. Once we did this fix, the array popped in magically by itself. It literally just came within spec as soon as we did this. It raised the drive point impedance to the exact value and we were in business. All for 10 minutes worth of work. This is the original phaser cabinet that that was purchased with the station. It's a Gates phaser. Looks very similar to a Gates a BC1G or a, a, a BC1T. This was basically a BC500G cabinet. Originally, the transmitter was a Gates BC500, and they bought the phaser from them. This phaser had been changed to 820, so a whole bunch of components got changed. And then when we changed everything, we had to change and add extra, extra stuff. So to isolate it, we had these long runs of copper tubing. Uh, so we couldn't get any proper isolation. So what you see there, the two big black coax feeds are actually just feeding or the long runs of, of copper tubing that we would normally use. And these provide enough isolation given their long lengths. You know, we're talking several feet. The one in the center is almost as tall as I am. I'm six feet tall. So we really needed to keep those lines isolated to keep the interactions between the two, uh, the two uh, sets of coils for each tower, the interactions down. There's a better picture of the front of the cabinet. And we had to convert the T networks that were inside to series LC networks. The reason for that is we're just adjusting how much power goes into a certain tower and how 
much we lag or advance the phase of the signal. Does the signal get there before or after another tower or the reference tower? And in this case, it's 120 degree, two degrees before or it's leading the reference tower by 120 degrees. At the end of the day, once we got all that work done and we got everything and everything just came right together, this is what we have. So at 810, the results, you can see, so minus 10 kilohertz, we're at 1.3 visual, and at 830, we are at 1.2 uh, with an SWR. As you can see at 820, we are close enough to 50J0 that the transmitter is going to be more than happy with that. At 49.3 ohms, minus 2 reactants. And that number varies dependent upon the not amount of energy that's coming in from 930. So that number actually jumps around a little bit, but that's close enough. Nighttime antenna tuning. The procedure, what we had to do to tune these, these ATUs, and the, the best way to do this is that instead of tuning each tower for 50J0, what you do is you place a dummy load at the input of each ATU. So where the coax comes in from the building, you disconnect it, and then you connect the 50, uh, 50 ohm uh, resistor dummy load to it. And you look back into the network and you tune for what's called the conjugate or the, the opposite. So if you have a reactance of say, you have 40 ohms of resistance and a reactance of minus 80, which is 80 ohms of capacitive reactance. Uh, what you want to tune for is you want to tune for that 40 ohms because resistance is resistance, but you want to tune for plus 80 or 80 ohms of inductive reactants. That's the best way to tune one of these arrays. Instead of looking for 50J0 at each ATU, you tune back and tune for the conjugate so that they cancel each other out. After all the, the fruits of our labor on the night antenna, uh, as you can see at minus 10 or at 810, we have 1.36 SWR. And at 830, we have 1.22 SWR. Well within spec. Quickly on the transmitters. The original main or backup transmitter was an AMFET-5, a really old first solid-state transmitter designed in the early 80s. It didn't have the bandwidth and the capability to do it, so it needed to be removed. There was a company, Harris Broadcast, which is now Gates Air. They made a line of series called the Gates Series, and they had a Gates 5 as the main transmitter here. That became the analog uh, backup or the digital uh, backup. It was not capable of doing MA3 fully. Uh, we ended up getting a brand new broadcast electronics AM6 to install as the new main. And then we needed a dummy load capable of handling the digital. We're dealing not with so much peak power, but we're dealing with a lot of peak voltage. You need a, a, a dummy load that's capable of handling that. So it's better to, to double up the value on your dummy load, station dummy load, to handle the peak voltage. That's why we're, you know, you're using vacuum caps in the input to all the T networks because you're dealing with a lot of peak voltage. Testing into a dummy load. If you tune a transmitter for uh, the hybrid system, MA1, which is the, the more bandwidth system or the higher bandwidth system, uh, you simply just tune it for that, that mode and then you flip it over into the all digital mode. All that adjustment is done. So you adjust the magnitude and phase components of our signal. In the digital, our phase component is a logic signal, uh, like a, a, a transistor to transistor logic, plus five switching at 820. And then you have the magnitude component, which is really like an audio component, and it goes way, way out. And that's all done, handled in, in the layer three of our system, how, they're, how they interact to form with the reference carrier, the unmodulated center frequency carriers you can see in the spectrum analyzer to form the, uh, the MA3 all digital waveform. So the scale factor, IQ scale factor, well, that simply is just adjusting how, how high the digital carriers you want them to go. You don't want them to go too high where the amplifier and the transmitter runs out of uh, what's called headroom, uh, where, where if it hit, hits the ceiling of what the amplifier is capable of, it'll just clip it. Distorting a signal like that is, is you'll never be able to decode the uh, digital signal. Uh, so once that was done, we turned it on. We got the experimental authorization from the commission, and they we gave them a date of July 16th of, of 2018 to turn it on. That's what we did, and we began to drive test it 
to see what, what was capable and what was going on. That's when we came into year two. We started seeing problems. There was poor stereo operation and no data services were coming through, which was a real head scratcher. The commission wanted us to know how we were going to measure power accurately with a digital signal. Analog is fair enough. You can just take the average, but the averages are different in digital because you're dealing once again with those peak voltages. Multiple audio channels, could we possibly do it? We don't know. We did, we, we've never tried it. So we wanted to give that a shot. The problem we ran into after all the head scratching and everything was we looked at the we looked at the magnitude component of an MA1 signal and an MA3 signal. And as you can see in the baseband here on a spectrum analyzer, the uh, MA1 uh, magnitude, our audio component, drops off fairly quickly. It has attenuated fairly quickly. Where in MA3, we're conveying a lot more information. We're conveying a lot more bandwidth for the audio services that the, the magnitude or audio component goes out much further before it falls off. At that frequency, what happens is, is it, so it, started falling, it starts falling off at about 110 kilohertz in the baseband. So what you need is you need a pulse duration modulator that's capable of being able to handle that frequency, the frequencies or audio frequencies that far out. And that's get done by Nyquist, Nyquist uh, theorem. So you have to be two times Nyquist. In other words, the switching frequency of a pulse duration or a pulse width modulator needs to be twice that of the audio that's being attenuated less than 60 dB in order to translate all of the carriers properly to properly form an MA3 signal. If we go back, you can see on the spectrum analyzer, we have a properly formed MA3 signal, but we weren't getting any stereo audio out of it and we couldn't get any pictures out of it. We just couldn't figure it out. So ultimately at the end of the day, what happened is what these pictures are showing is in a 64 clam system with the INQ carriers, they vector out what's called vector out to a predetermined location or a spot on the spectrum as to where the radio expects to see them and decode them properly. So in the BE transmitter, the broadcast electronics transmitter, you see on the left are the primary carriers, which are the plus and minus five kilohertz closest to the center. They're not, oh, they're okay. Most of the carriers fall within their, their, their coordinate, their, their polar coordinate. But they're not very well formed. They're kind of fuzzy, but the radio does a good enough job to convey the information. The center is the 16 quam component of the digital signal. And as you can see, there is no definition. There's a square, but a lot of carriers are getting thrown here, there, everywhere. You see little dots going further out, extending much further than, than, than they're even supposed to. The radio is going to decode some of those, but not all of those. So sometimes you were missing some data information. You weren't getting all of the station information, FCC call ID, certain components, certain things the receiver was just not being able to decode. To the far right is the extended carriers, which convey the actual stereo information. Which, So if the audio, if you're feeding stereo audio, it's not going to go mono. It's going to go full stereo with those extended carriers. As you can see, there is no rhyme or reason there. It's just one big ball of carriers just vectoring all over which way they want. And the receiver has no idea what to do with it and literally just ignores it all because it just doesn't know what to do with it. It doesn't know which carrier is supposed to go where. Nothing is defined. What happened was is we found out that the PDM modulator in the BE uh, AM6 simply didn't switch fast enough. It had a PDM switch or clock of around 200, about 225 kilohertz. And it was a four pole polyphase switch combining to get you that 225. It just wasn't enough. Uh, we ended up having to install another transmitter. This time we installed a Nautel, a company in, in, in Canada. We installed an NX5 which had a nine-pole polyphase PDM switch that switched at 370 kilohertz. And also they use a forward uh, pre-correction. They, they look at the signal forward 
they pre-correct it, send it back to the amplifier if there's a problem to reform the carrier. So what you get with all of that, so it increases the headroom of the amplifier by doing that. If there's a carrier that gets clipped, it's it looks, it says, okay, there's one that's clipped. So it's looking ahead at the signal before it sends it out to the output network of the transmitter. Goes back and redefines it. And by doing so, you create a little bit more amplifier headroom, more crust factor uh, reduction. It's essentially helping compressing those, those those carriers down to help the amplifier give it more headroom. We're only talking about 1.2 dB, but all 1.2 dB can mean the world of difference in, in a digital signal. With all that said, comparing the carriers from the BE to the Nautel, you can see they're much tighter formed. Everything is falling right into place. Every single dot is being put where it needs to be put. Every I and Q from the 64 QAM is, is going to its predetermined position, and it's vectoring quite nicely. The center, as you can see, very once again, very well formed, 16 QAM, all the dots belonging right where they're supposed to, not a single flyer or outlier. To the far right, the secondaries, you can see there's a little bit of, it starts to get a little bit more messy. But once again, all the carriers are properly formed. They all vector nicely into their coordinate. And you can see that the radio, any radio, would be able to decode that. We noticed a vast improvement in the reception of the station. We immediately noticed that the audio went from mono to stereo. We were able to start sending pictures for artist experience, uh, station logos. We were starting to convey data information that is conveyed in those extended those extended carriers. So the next next project we found is, remember way back at the beginning, I showed you that 0.015 capacitor, the tune out, that inductive reactance in the transmission line. It did its job, it tuned out the reactants and, and made the transmitter happy. But what happened was we lost what's called Hermitian symmetry. So if you look at the, the SWR on a Smith chart and plotted those, you would see a little cusp or, or a, a horseshoe that looks like this. And it either goes cusp right or cusp left. It, it does the, you know, goes that way or this way. You want it that way. What was happening was with that capacitor, it was inducing 60 degrees of phase shift in the capacitive direction. Well, what was happening was, is now it was going like this. And we don't want that. The receiver will work, but it's still not happy especially in the fringe areas where we start, the forward correction starts losing the signal and you start getting more and more dropouts of the station. So what we decided to do is we decided to build a 60 degree phase shift network. And we designed it so that the input impedance and the output impedance were the same. The only thing we were doing was shifting phase to correct for that 60 degree phase shift. Once we got it to the point on a Smith chart, where it was pointing either cusp right or cusp left, we started noticing fewer bit errors, and it improved the reception even further uh, by several miles. It was, it, it was very noticeable just by adding this T-network into, into the array, uh, how noticeable the, uh, the change was. So as you can see, uh, we did some drive te uh, tests once we were done. The green represents the stereo audio. The yellow represents uh, mono or the core only carriers, the primary core only carriers. And then at the end of the route is where it absolutely fails. If you look at the northern leg that's driving towards from Frederick on US 15 north towards Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, we lost the station finally in Harrisburg, in North Harrisburg, going towards Duncan and PA. At that point, the contour, single contour is 0.15 millivolts. That's absolutely amazing. Uh, normally, the FCC protects you to the two millivolt, and it's considered the half millivolt is pretty much the unlistenable. Anything beyond the half millivolt is unlistenable to the average user in analog. We were able to decode this station in many, many places. In North Harrisburg, in Cambridge, Maryland, which is on the other side of the bay, all the way out to Cumberland, Maryland, which is two hours away, easily a good 60 miles, in very rugged mountainous terrain. Uh, the system just absolutely performed, and it performed better than we could have ever expected. 
And this is one of the advantages that you will have with, with a digital system. It's a one or a zero, you have it or you don't. But when you have it, 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 it latches on for a long time. Uh, you can see the nighttime, you can see the nighttime contours and getting the station at 460 watts to the Pennsylvania border. Once again, was just in, at night, at the dead of night. These measurements were done in December, well into Skywave, probably about 9 p.m. at night. I, I, I drove these routes. So we were well into Skywave and we were getting solid stereo reception to what is called the uh, NIF, half NIF, or the Nighttime Interference Free Contour. That's calculated by the commission when you file for the license. For WWFD, it's guaranteed non-interference at 9.8 millivolts. We were getting stereo information all the way up to 4.8 millivolts. And we were losing the signal at 0.5 millivolts, which is at nighttime is just absolutely is just phenomenal. We have test monitor receivers all over the United States and Canada. We are able to decode audio one night in Philadelphia, in the monitor in Philadelphia. We were able to get station call sign and information, uh, text data, in our Montreal, Quebec monitor. Skywave does crazy things. You know, to, to, to see those kinds of results is just absolutely uh, uh, amazing. Uh, power measurement, uh, very quickly. It, it can either be done with a spectrum analyzer. You, you, shut the, you shut the digital signal off, measure the channel power of the unmodulated carrier, then turn the digitals on, reducing the, 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 the digital signal until it's the same channel power as the unmodulated. That's the technical way. It's also very expensive. It's a you know, very modern, modern way of doing it. But as I show you in the next slide, what basically is old becomes new again. We found the most accurate and most inexpensive and easiest way to measure power was just to simply use a thermocouple ammeter. For old legacy AMs, AMs that were built from the 30s to the 60s. I bet you there's tons of these things laying around. And you just go into the J-plugs in the ATU. In the antenna tuning units, you have uh, what's normally called J-plugs. So you could quickly disconnect the input and the output going to the tower. Various points, uh, monitor points in the phaser, you have these J-plugs. So it's just a quick and easy way to get into to be able to tune and measure uh, your, your various components throughout the, uh, the, the, the antenna system. So here you just mount it at the output and you measure the current. And that's your licensed current. And that's the easiest way to do because you're just, the digital method, it's easy to do with the peak, with, with the peak voltage because all you're doing is measuring the heat that, or, or measuring the work that the resistor in the thermocouple ammeter is just doing. You're just measuring that work. So it's really the best way. Commonly used meters now, uh, like the uh, the Delta Electronics on the left, uh, use a sampling, uh, a toroid sample out at the ATU through the feed line, send it back to a coax and feed it into a diode detector. Well, the diode detector is not going to do a very good job of averaging. It's gonna measure peak, but it's not gonna measure average. So your, 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 your measurement is actually going to be lower. It's not going to be correct. So the, the, the station, if you don't use a thermocouple ammeter, they're going to figure, well, we need to turn the power up on the transmitter. Well, now you're out of license power uh, because you're not measuring the power properly. You need to do that with a thermocouple ammeter. Uh, we were able to broadcast an HD2 on December of 2019. And what I mean by that is there's now the station which normally currently plays a music format. And we were able to put another audio service onto this signal, which was WTOP, a news station that Hubbard owns in Washington, D.C. Uh, we were able to transmit that audio and, and play it. Also, as you can see down on the lower right, we were able to get a station logo for it as well. So that's of interest to broadcasters, giving AM another footing. And it, it, gives, them, it gives AM stations an equal footing to their FM sisters. And the fact that they can transmit an HD1 and HD2, they can transmit data services, text data. It, it, it gives AM a level playing field now as compared to FM, where FM, you know, you had stereo, the way, you know, FM works, analog works. 
you know, you can convey stereo information. You can do it in AM analog, but unfortunately, no, no standard was ever agreed in the United States, and it just it fell by the wayside. So is it possible to do AM analog stereo? Of course. But can we do AM analog stereo and run a second audio channel, like much like an SCA on an FM? Yes, we can. Uh, 